Thanks to Curiosity Stream for supporting my channel. The past two and a half years, the pandemic has accelerated the use of artificial intelligence in educational settings, primarily as it related, at least initially, to AI proctoring of exams that students were taking at home because they're wasn't a teacher in a classroom to monitor them as they took it. And I made a whole video about this towards the beginning of the pandemic, but if I'm being honest, I thought that the pandemic would eventually wind down and the combination of people returning to classroom settings and the backlash that came out against these systems pretty soon after they were implemented would result in them basically fading away, never to be seen again. But it has been two and a half years. The pandemic is not over. I'm still working from home while Kind of. I'm in LA right now. And if anything, the use of these AI systems to surveil students has actually expanded from just being used in real time to detect things like cheating to being used 24-7, 365 days a year to detect things from potential mental health crises to cyberbullying. And there are a bunch of companies that offer these types of services to schools in different varieties of packages, but I'm going to focus on a company called Gaggle for most of this video because it's one of the more well-known companies and it was the company that had the most reporting on it that I was able to find. Gaggle offers an AI system with human content moderators, so they have an algorithm that automatically flags potentially concerning content based on a database of keywords that they have curated, and then that content is reviewed by both algorithms and human content moderators to see whether or not there is a potential intervention that needs to be made, whether or not someone needs to reach out to a school or reach out to a parent or anything like that. And they're able to access the content that students are using from things like homeworks to group chats to emails, usually via school issued devices, although they also work with platforms like Google Classroom. And you can see some of the systems that they work with here. So if you are issued a laptop or an iPad or something by your school, they may have installed this software on it. Additionally, if you log into, for example, your child's Google Classroom account to check their homework, they may actually have access to parts of your phone as a parent or as a caregiver in addition to the stuff that your kid is doing on Google Classroom, which I think is kind of wild. The CEO and founder of Gaggle did a really great interview with the MIT Tech Review that I'd highly recommend checking out. It's a podcast. I'll link it in the description. And one of the things that he talks about is that while Gaggle actually does recommend that schools let students know that this software is on their devices, a lot of schools don't, and they're not obligated to. And part of this is because a lot of the privacy laws that concern students haven't really been updated since the early 2000s. So FERPA, which is the Family Educational Privacy Rights Act, is the main one that people talk about when it comes to accessing student data. And it's very much similar to things like HIPAA, actually. It's, it's very much focused on not opening a file cabinet and taking out a file with your kid's name on it and handing it to someone random, but it's not as focused on making sure that technological systems that your children interacts with that contain student data are secured. In terms of what these systems are used for, there are a lot of different things that they are marketed for, things that Gaggle markets itself for, but the main things that they tend to be looking for fall into four categories, and they are suicide and self-harm, violence towards other, harassment, and drugs and alcohol. And as I mentioned earlier, the idea here, as actually outlined in their safety report from the 2021-2022 school year, is that they go through a content analysis process that uses machine learning to flag concerning content in students' school-issued accounts for review and might block potentially harmful content. So if you had like safe search when you were in middle school, same thing. There's also an expert review process. So content that gets flagged is then reviewed by Gaggle's safety expert, which I do think is good, is comprised of people like social workers and crisis interventionalists and educators and therapists. So it's not just people who are purely on the tech side deciding what counts as something that you should intervene in. And then those experts essentially verify whether or not the content is actually concerning, understand the context around it, and determine the level of severity and whether or not it needs to be forwarded on to the actual school. And so they claim that in these severe crisis events, they can have someone responding to the event within 17 minutes. It's important to note that outside of these crisis events, and actually even within these crisis events, how a school chooses to handle the information that they're given is kind of up to the school. And I think that's important because depending on the school district, the automatic response for an alert like this might be to get something like law enforcement involved, regardless of whether or not that's actually a useful and appropriate intervention 
to mount. And that's especially concerning to me considering that these systems do seem to disproportionately affect low-income and marginalized students. And when it comes to law enforcement and marginalized groups, the intersection is often not great. At the same time, you would think that having a system that can flag potentially concerning things, allow for early interventions in mental health or cyberbullying or anything else that might constitute a student safety concern would be a good thing. And I should say I'm not like a K through 12 educator, so, or a parent, <laughs> I was a child at one point, so I can't speak to that experience, but I, I think I can speak to the student side of things. And when it comes to whether or not I think that this is a good way of intervening in these types of things, I'm a little bit on the fence. Largely because from a student perspective, and it's actually really interesting if you do read their annual report of safety, all of their testimonials, all of the things that are hyping up this product are from staff members, are from people who work in K through 12 systems. None of them are from students. There's no student testimonial in here. I also think that there's a lot of questions to be asked about the dictionary of keywords that Kaggle has, that Gaggle has cultivated in order to flag concerning content, because one of the things that is in it are LGBTQ plus terms, so lesbian and gay are part of this dictionary. And this actually resulted in a Minneapolis student being outed to their parents without their consent. Gaggle says they include these terms in their dictionary so that they can essentially reduce the risk of LGBTQ students self-harming or potentially committing suicide. And that is a really big problem in the youth and general LGBTQ plus community. I just don't know that this is the way to potentially do it. I think the other thing for me with these types of systems is that it's not actually clear to me that these have helped all that much. So when I was doing the research for this video, and I should say now, if anyone wants to do more digging on this topic, if somebody wants to go FOIA someone, if that's the appropriate thing to do, please do. I would love to read more about the data behind this because when I was doing the research, a lot of the data that I was finding and a lot of the information that I was finding came from the companies themselves. So there wasn't a centralized place where schools were necessarily reporting how effective these systems were at actually reducing incidences of self-harm, of harassment, of drug and alcohol use, anything like that. As I mentioned earlier, all the testimonials that these places use are also not from students, so it doesn't really seem like the student perspective is being included here, which I think is kind of concerning given that, given that students are being surveilled and I think that they should be considered in that process. <laughs> so do I think that this is an inherently bad idea? My honest answer is that I'm not sure. When I set out to make this video, I was hoping to have an answer at the end. And what I found was a rabbit hole that both went deeper than I realized and also didn't have clear answers. The, the data isn't really there. A lot of the data that we're getting is coming from companies who have a stake in profiting off of people using these systems. And so it's, it's a little bit hard to see whether or not these systems are actually effective. On top of that, when I think about the other ways, when it comes to things like AI proctoring that we're seeing artificial intelligence systems used in education, we've already seen issues with race and gender bias that I can only imagine would also likely propagate to systems like this. So when it comes to finding better ways of making sure that students stay safe and are getting mental health treatment that they need. I think what I would really like to see is just more work going to resources and systems that can help children get like the mental health treatment that they need and the support that they need before it gets so bad that you need to call the cops or their parents to stage an intervention. And for students to have people that they trust that they can go talk to that isn't like places like Reddit where they might end up talking to the wrong people. And so whether or not using AI systems to ideally minimize student self-harm is good, is effective, I think that the issue of making sure that students are safe is a much, much bigger problem than any one company or any one algorithm is going to solve. So as I mentioned at the top of this video, a lot of the research for this video touched on sensitive topics related to self-harm that might get this video demonetized. So I did upload the full uncensored version to Nebula for anyone who wants to learn more. 
If you haven't heard, Nebula is a streaming platform built by me and some of my friends, including people like Tierzu, Simon Clark, and Jacqueline from Nothing But Tech. On Nebula, you can find ad-free versions of all of our videos, plus Nebula Plus bonus content that you won't find on YouTube. You'd also get access to our Nebula Originals, which you can't find anywhere else, including a very good trivia show where I competed against Brian from Real Engineering and Dave from City Beautiful in a bunch of fun and bizarre challenges, including trying to build an Ikea chair while answering math problems. And the best way to sign up for Nebula is actually through CuriosityStream, who are kindly sponsoring today's video. CuriosityStream is a subscription streaming service with thousands of documentaries and nonfiction videos. In fact, if you're interested in learning more about how people are using AI in the modern world, I would highly recommend checking out their series, The Joy of AI. CuriosityStream loves independent creators and wants to help us grow our platform, so if you click on the link in the description or use my promo code JORDAN, you can get access to CuriosityStream for 26% off their annual plans, with Nebula included for free for as long as you are a CuriosityStream member. That's less than $15 a year. Signing up for CuriosityStream is a great way to directly support my channel, getting to watch my videos ad-free, so sign up for CuriosityStream and Nebula at CuriosityStream.com jordan or using the promo code JORDAN.